So you're very, very welcome to our presentation tonight on the Wicklow Mountains Path Condition Survey that was uh, carried out last year by Chris York from Walking the Talk with some help from others as well. Um, my name is Helen Lawless. I work with Mountaineering Ireland, the representative body for hill walkers and climbers on the island of Ireland. And as regular users of the all of our mountains, but of course the, the Wicklow Mountains in particular, um, the impact, uh, the results from cumulative footfall has been uh, of interest to us for, for some time, um, partly because other people uh, call it out as damage and we want to ensure that's kept in perspective uh, in the context of all the other impacts on upland habitats and environments. Uh, but also because, I mean, we, we do recognize that we're, we're part of the problem and we want to be part of the solution. And um, that is also about ensuring that the solutions that are implemented in response to path erosion are ones that are appropriate to an upland setting rather than, for example, having a, a lowland style path um, imposed in a, a mountain landscape. And you know, path erosion, I mentioned it's been a concern for Mountaineering Ireland for, for some time. It is because, because of the impact on the environment, um, it is damage creating, in some cases, quite significant scars across our mountains, but also the degradation of those, um, and I daren't even call them paths, but those popular routes across our mountains that impacts on the quality of the experience enjoyed by our members as well. And we have a desire to ensure that a consistent quality approach is applied in response to erosion. And some of you will be aware that back in 2012, we held a conference in Glendalough titled Helping the Hills. And it sought to draw on the experience of responding to upland path erosion, particularly in Britain, where depending on which uh, part of the island you're, you're talking about, the larger island, um, they are some decades ahead of us in dealing with these issues. So clearly uh, there, there's much we can learn. And it was in the, the follow through to that process um, that we, we first came across Chris York as well. Indeed, his work was commended to us before we actually had the opportunity to, to meet. Um, I should, I suppose, tell you just a little bit about the Wicklow Mountains Path Condition Survey uh, before I hand you over to Chris. The survey was commissioned by the Wicklow Uplands Council um, jointly with uh, the National Parks and Wildlife Service and Wicklow Mountains National Park. Um, there was a, a stakeholder group, I suppose, that uh, drove the, the project and Mountaineering Ireland was part of that. And I do want to pay credit to Jim Sheehan, our representative on the Wicklow Uplands Council, who kept this on the Wicklow Uplands Council agenda for a few years until the Wicklow Uplands Council was in a position to secure funding uh, for the study uh, through the, the LEADER programme. The other partners in that steering group um, include County Wicklow Partnership, Wicklow County Council, Quilcha and Mountain Mehill. And it's um, important, I think, to acknowledge that this isn't the first um, path condition survey uh, conducted in the Wicklow Mountains. Um, there was one undertaken by Mountain Mehill uh, back in 2002, 2003. So when we started the conversations with the Wicklow Uplands Council about conducting this survey, uh, one of the things we were seeking to do was to build on the earlier survey by Mountain Mehill and to correlate the, the two sets the two sets of findings so that we could see where um, the greatest degree of change was happening in the, okay, I will call it a path network, but I suppose it's important to, to make clear that the paths we're talking about are, they're informal hill walking routes that are, they're not waymarked, they're not designated trails. Um, in some cases, there isn't any formal management in place. And that's one of the challenges we face in how we respond to the, the erosion. Um, and the lines that exist on the hills, uh, they're really the product of cumulative footfall over decades, many decades in, in most cases. And when 
and Louis O'Byrne, um, who's here with us tonight. Louis is the current chairperson of the Wicklow Uplands Council. But when we started the, the conversation with the Wicklow Uplands Council about conducting this survey or commissioning it, um, Louis, um, myself, uh, sat down uh, with Jim Sheehan uh, in a cafe in Roundwood, and we started to identify the locations that we all knew where there is some evidence of erosion. And very quickly, we came up with, uh, well, Jim, being a former maths teacher, tabulated it all, and it came up to 100 kilometres or so of routes across the Wicklow Mountains. But by the time we um, had a contract in place with Chris, the, the 100 kilometres had stretched to 167. Uh, so it, it turned out to be a, a bigger undertaking than any of us had anticipated. And I am going to hand over to Chris shortly. Uh, just by way of introduction, um, I want to say that uh, Chris is, um, is based in Aberdeenshire in Scotland. Um, he's a partner in uh, Walking the Talk, a, a consultancy that does a lot of work on path management, access, and indeed uh, peatland restoration as well. Um, so that's uh, an interesting skill set to bring to bear on our survey of the path network in the, the Wicklow Mountains. And Chris has done similar work elsewhere in Ireland. Um, he did a survey in the Galtee Mountains, I think back in 2015, 2016. Um, Chris has been very involved uh, along with Mountaineering Ireland in the discussions about how we respond to the path erosion on Croke Patrick, uh, where many of you will know uh, there's Excellent work being done uh, by a team at present. Um, also, uh, Chris and I have been involved in um, responding to erosion at Errigal, um, perhaps not with the same degree of success, but there is work taking place there currently. And in fact, some of us from Mountaineering Ireland are, are going to have a look at that next week. And we've also been, um, we've worked together um, in the Morns um, at Sleeve Gullion, and at Quilca, uh, looking at how to respond to the erosion um, on the summit plateau of Quilca. So look, I, I think that's enough to give you a sense that um, Chris has a good understanding of uh, the Irish uh, upland path uh, scene, um, I suppose. And look, without further ado, Chris, um, I'll hand over to you. And um, I think you, you would probably prefer to keep questions to the end, would you? Yeah, if that's okay. Please, yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Just to keep my train of thought going. We don't want to derail your train. Yep. <laughs> very, very little brain. Thanks, Helen. Um, yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, thanks for coming along, giving up one of your evenings. Uh, uh, I am not in Aberdeenshire at the moment. I'm uh, down in deepest, darkest uh, England Shire. Um, and I've borrowed the next door neighbor's Wi-Fi. So if I disappear, it's because uh, my next door, the, my mum's next door neighbors turned off the Wi-Fi. So I'm hoping I've got my fingers crossed that everything's going to work. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to try and share my screen and uh, then we can crack on. Um, hopefully. Hopefully that works. <coughs> Looking good, so, Chris. Yep. Just to uh, sort of as, as way of introduction, um, Helen mentioned that uh, the background I've got, um, I, I've been sort of uh, looking at upland paths for 20, 25 years uh, in Scotland um, and um, have sort of expanded, I guess, uh, by invitation across to the island of Ireland uh, since 2015. Um, and um, Really what, what we try and specialize in is um, assessments of the, the condition uh, of upland paths and coming up with solutions um, for their management, which could include repair of the paths. Um, so that's essentially what I've, I've done. Um, and uh, this 167 kilometers was a, was a, a it turned into a bit of a labor of love, I must confess. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll start with a summary. Um, I'll start at the end and then work backwards if that helps. Um, so what, what, we, what we 
did was an amber per path survey. That's um, a specific uh, type of survey um, that was designed uh, by the Upland Path Advisory Group. It's been around for 20, 25 years. Um, and what that is, is a, is a consistent and repeatable method for um, describing upland paths. Um, and it um, collects um, the sort of quantitative and qualitative data for every path. And we looked at this um, set of 50 paths um, across the Wicklow Mountains um, and surveyed 167 kilometers in the end. Um, each path in, in this sort of survey method, you break it into sections where the sections are of a similar sort of um, characteristic. Um, so we've got 350 sections uh, to deal with, and we took 3,100 photos, and those are all geotagged, so we know exactly where those images come from. Um, and that forms the basis of, of the sort of analysis that we have done, looking at what it is, um, what's the, the condition of paths, and what are the potential options for managing those paths. Um, we did a little calculation, and if you were to try and um, repair um, the paths, um, just the paths that we think are feasible to repair, you're looking at a minimum of 4,000 days of labour. So somehow we might have to find the funds to source that labour. That's if we decide that this is, this is the right thing to do. What I'm going to do is run through some of the issues um, rather than look at the I didn't detail. Get that. Could you try again? Rather than look at the, the detail of, of the survey, I want to look at the issues um, that um, need to be put ahead in front of us before we take any decisions. So the biggest thing I think we need to, to recognise for, for Wicklow is the peatlands. The peatlands themselves are an asset and they are a liability. They're an asset in that they are a huge store of carbon. Um, and with the current sort of, uh, climate crisis and biodiversity crisis, peatlands are a hugely important area for um, storing carbon um, out of the atmosphere. Um, and from that perspective, we need to think about how to manage them in a way that keeps that carbon where it is. Um, but from a path management perspective, it's also a liability because peatlands are very, very sensitive to um, trampling. Um, not all of the uh, peatlands are in perfect condition. Um, this is uh, Barnacullion. Um, in pretty poor uh, condition. There's, there's nothing left uh, in areas, uh, there's no vegetation left over large areas of uh, ground. And that obviously creates a problem um, for if you are walking over it, uh, it's it incredibly uh, sensitive to trampling. Um, but in terms of the, the potential uh, in places, there are some places where that erosion uh, of the peat has actually come down right to the, the, the underlying hard ground. And that in some places gives almost an opportunity um, to look at uh, trying to uh, define a path through an area of deep peat without causing any more damage. Um, the thing that you really, I, I want to stress is that deep peat makes path management really challenging, um, really, really challenging. And I'm, I'm going to run through some of what those challenges are. But as I highlight here, that some of those areas where you've lost the peat already, they might produce an opportunity um, for some form of path management. But we need to think about this very carefully. Um, just to give you an idea of, of the, the spread and the, the types of paths that we're looking at. Um, we have categorized the paths and the path sections according to how much peat there was. Um, and the, the sort of orange 
and uh, red areas are the ones that are problematic from the perspective of having deep peat. And I'm going to give you a bit more of an idea about what I mean by deep peat. But this gives you an idea of, of the scale of the task that we're talking about. Um, there are some paths that have um, no peat or uh, very shallow peat. Um, and these paths could potentially be uh, repaired using traditional upland path methods. I'm not suggesting that all of these paths should be, but they can at least be done without a, a significant uh, problem. Um, so the survey indicated that was something like 192 of the sections were on shallow or uh, mineral, shallow peat or mineral soils. So that was 77 kilometers, less than half of the total surveyed length. Um, and I'm not at all suggesting that that's the minimum length that needs to be repaired. It's just to give you an idea of, we're actually still talking about 55% of the survey area um, having deep peat. Um, deep peat on a low gradient is not necessarily impossible to deal with. Um, on a, a, a level area, you might be able to um, float a path on the peat. And that's been done in a lot of areas. Uh, if you think about areas that have got uh, roads that run over uh, deep peat bogs, uh, they've floated uh, the roads over them. So the, the kind of precedent, if you like, in, or the technique is there, it's possible to do that. Um, so areas on the flat, I think this is um, Loch Bray, um, and this is an area, uh, it's actually up on the moraine, um, where you look at it and you go, oh yeah, that that's, looks okay. There's a, there's a bit of um, sort of trampling there. Until you look at the, uh, sorry, I just need to go back. Um, this area just here, that's my peat probe. And that peat probe is a meter long. So that indicates that there is at least a meter of peat sitting on the surface here. So if we wanted to uh, do any path work, we would have to work with a meter of peat. So on the flat, it's possible, but it's not totally simple. Um, as soon as you get onto steeper gradients, and by that I'm talking about 15% gradient, which is not actually very steep. Um, if you ride a bike, you can probably just about still cycle up a 15% a gradient without um, having a heart attack. Um, but it's steep enough to create a problem. Um, and there's actually quite a few of the paths. They're not all of them um, have a very deep peat and it's steep, but you can see the difference between the, the low gradient and the steep gradient. So some of them, have got significant lengths um, where there is steep ground and deep peat. Um, so the problem where you've got peat on a gradient is that, well, gravity uh, takes uh, precedence. Um, and as soon as you've lost the, um, the vegetation cover, you get erosion of the peat. Um, due to that, that gravitational force. So uh, that's Brian Dunn there, um, and he, he isn't actually um, without legs. He's standing in a, a deep gully um, that's very, very narrow. But you can see the other area um, next to him. Um, that's been trampled, um, and the um, sort of natural forces, if you like, have taken over and uh, started to erode that. So that creates our problem, as soon as we've broken through that surface, um, the natural processes take over um, and there's something potentially needs to be done there. Um, just to give you an idea of, of, of what we're talking about, where you've got more than 50 centimetres of, of peat, um, and by 50 centimetres, that's what the usual sort of um, definition, if you like, of what um, blanket bog is. So anything over 50 centimetres of, of peat would be classed as a blanket bog. Um, you can float a path. Um, and so I've got a, a picture there um, showing what you need to do is put a geotextile um, on 
Uh, that could be a synthetic geotextile, something like Teram, which is the white sort of um, uh, fabric-y stuff. Or in some cases, you could use uh, sheep fleece um, to uh, create a, a, a barrier, if you like. And on top of that, you would uh, potentially construct a, a path and that would give you a walking surface. And the alternative then is uh, what's been done in places like uh, the Pennine Way in England, uh, where you use flagstones. Um, so you can then create a, a, essentially a causeway across an area. So in shallow gradients, that's what you can do. And it's, it's possible to do without um, too many difficulties. As soon as you get onto that gradient, anything between 15 and 30 percent, the gravity is, is, is starting to act on um, any path that you construct. So it's possible that what you might have to do is, is pin um, the path in place. So anchor it uh, to, to the ground, because obviously, I hope, um, when you've got um, flow of peat down a hill, um, anything that's sitting on that peat is also going to move. And the movement of, of people, the, the, the tread of people, is going to cause deformation. So if you haven't pinned it to the ground, um, that creates a problem. The bigger problem is the actual depth of peat. There are places um, that I've seen um, in, in Wicklow where there's at least two metres um, and there are probably areas where there's three or four meters of, of peat. Um, so actually trying to pin uh, something to the hard surface might be really challenging. Um, there are unfortunately quite a few areas where it's even steeper than 30%. Um, and uh, this is on the, the photo is uh, low born, going up to low born. Um, there is no anchorage point um, on this. Uh, so gravity really does uh, take over. Um, so if you were to try and build anything, you would need to have structural integrity. The whole thing would have to be essentially self-supporting. Um, you can see from that photo on the, on the side, there's no materials there that you could comfortably use, um, sort of natural materials, if you like, that you could comfortably use um, that are sitting nearby. So you'd have to import everything. Um, and that in itself becomes quite a logistical um, nightmare. Um, and then the, the other issue with steep uh, slopes and deep peat is actually keeping people on a path. Um, as soon as you're on a steep bit of ground, if you make the path too uncomfortable for people to walk on, they step off. And as soon as people are stepping off, that particularly on uh, peat areas, creates a real problem of instability. Even if you thought you've got it stable, it will create instability around the margins. So hopefully you can recognize that there's some real challenges in terms of what can we actually do feasibly um, in some of these areas. And it's we're talking you know more than half of the, the mountain paths that, that I surveyed. The, one th the other issues we need to think about are related to um, sort of factors around visitor management and, and the things that we need to think about of when people want to come. Um, and we were thinking of, of this in terms of the, the repairs to paths were not designed to be a, a, a tourism draw, if you like. And we're not looking at um, improving or creating paths uh, in a way that we require additional uh, car parking directly as a result of uh, repairing those paths. It does happen. Um, it's not the case that we can say, oh, well, there won't be uh, any more visitors. But the, the underlying sort of principle is, is not for it to be a, a tourism draw um, in, its, in itself. Um, you, you can't control everything, but what, we, what we're looking at is repairing rather than um, uh, developing. Um, and the issue that we've got is that in some places, you've got very little car parking. There, there's space for maybe five or 10 cars at the most. 
Um, and so the issue um, begins to, to change is if you're not trying to uh, increase the amount of parking, it gives you a problem of can you actually do those repairs um, and justifiably say, well, we're not going to have any impact. So um, Loch Bray is a, is a case in point. There's, there's space for about 15 cars in the old quarry and um, possibly uh, down the side of the road. But if we were to do a, a major uh, infrastructure improvement in that area, we would have generate a real problem for car parking. Um, and particularly if you look at the fact that we've got three access points, um, potentially you've got people then walking down uh, the very narrow road. So it, it's something that we have to think about in terms of, is it the right thing to be doing to be um, repairing those paths where there isn't any car parking available? Um, the thing that's completely out of our control um, is that of social media. Um, and we've got to recognise that it's there. Um, and so obviously uh, Loch Aula um, is, has become the, the heart-shaped loch and uh, has become very popular. And you can see the damage that's been done. Um, and it's, it looks to be very sort of um, recent damage. Um, and the, the problem is that we can't actually anticipate uh, the speed of change. So we, in, in any of the, the work that we do, we can't anticipate what's coming up next uh, in terms of social media. Um, and we can't really un, uh, sort of predict the duration of that pressure. We can't tell how long people are going to be finding uh, Loch Aula a, a really um, sort of attractive place. It's possible that people will get bored of it quite quickly. So if we were to dive in and say, right, this is a, a place that we've got to do something about, um, we might find that we would spend a huge amount of resources and then uh, six months later find that nobody was going there anymore. Um, another issue is relating to tourism hotspots um, and trying to uh, understand how um, or whether it's possible to expand um, uh, tourism, if you like, and to use the mountains as a draw. Um, and I think, I hope it's fairly obvious that um, from what I've said so far, um, that vast areas of peatland are, are really not um, capable of absorbing uh, um, high numbers of additional people. Um, and this particular uh, picture here, this is from uh, the, the back of Jouse, um, heading towards War Hill. Um, and the, if you can read it, it says, please keep on the path. Um, actually, there is, there's never been a, a path constructed here or, or even um, particularly, so to speak, developed here. All that's been done is a few way, way markers have been put out. Um, and then you've got this very, very wide, probably 30 or 40 metre wide um, damage zone uh, where the vegetation has changed as a result of the, um, the use over time. So if we're thinking about the idea of dispersal of, of, um, of people from tourism hotspots, hot my suggestion is that um, the mountains are probably not a great idea. We need to think about what is the visitor capacity of anywhere um, in terms of tourism hotspots. We need to put things in robust environments and we need to think about the infrastructure that goes alongside it. Um, simple parking, we've already talked that, about that as well, but things like toilets. Um, these are all things that are just not there in mountain areas and the, the more you uh, look at the idea of developing them, the more pressure there will be for this additional um, infrastructure if you like and we need would need to think about where people want to go what behavior you know how they behave and the issues around visitor safety and all of those things in my mind make it quite difficult to justify uh, using open mountains for that tourism destination um, and coming back to the blanket bogs but from the perspective of uh, the bog itself. 
they are incredibly sensitive ha habitats and they're very susceptible to trampling. That's trampling by us and by um, grazing animals. Um, and it's really important to sort of highlight the fact that that grazing pressure um, is not just today's grazing pressure. This is the grazing pressure over decades and possibly centuries um, that has worn out um, the kind of the, the peat bogs, uh, their ability to um, kind of look after themselves. Um, that grazing pressure, of course, we've got to think in, in Wicklow as well. It's not just uh, sheep, it is deer as well. Um, and obviously, uh, when you're talking about uh, managing grazing pressure, it might be possible to manage grazing pressure through um, talking to farmers, but um, managing uh, grazing pressure with deer, there is probably only one solution and it involves a gun. Um, and that's not always uh, a popular thing. So there's potentially a bit of work to be done if, if we think that that's an important thing to, to deal with. And we've got to take into account the fact that, you know, climate change is happening. Um, things are changing and the, the peat bogs are having going to have to respond. They may even become more sensitive to um, damage and therefore possibly even more susceptible to, to trampling. So we're up against it in, in this particular area as, as people that really enjoy going into those areas and wanting to, to experience them. Um, just to give you an idea, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, it is possible to uh, to restore peatlands. This picture is actually from um, Scotland. It's uh, the northwest uh, near Achnasheen. Um, and this is after some restoration has been done. These areas were um, really badly um, eroded um, and uh, peat hags and, uh, and gullies. Um, and this is the kind of work that can be done um, and this is only 12 months after the, the work has been completed. And you can see already that there's um, a lot more vegetation there and the, the, the peat bog is holding on to the water much better. Um, but again, the issue here is if we spent a lot of money uh, restoring those um, peatlands, we need to think about what would, would be the impacts then of going back in and trampling all over it. So again, it, it sounds a bit negative, but um, we've got to be uh, thoughtful of how we are going to tackle um, restoring peatlands and also wh where the pressure from people is likely to be. Um, but I think uh, it's probably fair to say we've got a, a bigger issue um, in um, Wicklow in terms of off-road vehicles, quads and scramblers. I know. Other areas, mountain areas, have got them as well. Um, but this was one of the, the issues that I picked up um, across the whole area. Um, and the damage done by quads and scramblers in some places far outweighs, the, if you like, the recreational damage. Um, and um, it's the ongoing uh, use. And again, on very steep um, gradients. So the, the, some of these are 30 40% um, gradients and uh, the, the, the quad bikes and scramblers are going straight down the hill. And that is an obvious uh, erosion line for any, any water. So even if we're thinking about, can we repair some of these paths? Um, it would be pretty pointless to do so unless we can manage this. And I'm gonna use the word illegal because the majority of this is illegal use of off-road vehicles. We need to find a way of tackling this because any of the the work that's done um to re to repair and restore uh paths is likely to get trashed by uh, off-road vehicles um if they're still using it and I, I think it's fair to say that there have been some um recent uh successes in terms of in intervening uh and uh, i think there have been um the beginnings of some prosecutions which i think is really good news um, for uh, the peatlands and, and Wicklow uh, itself. Um, the thing that's really important as well is re recognising that if we do do some path work, we can't just um, do it and walk away. Um, so that any work that's been being proposed needs to have a commitment um, to long-term maintenance or long-term care 
whatever word you want to use. I know the word maintenance is not really very popular, um, but um, it, whatever happens, you have to maintain it. It's a bit like buying a, a car and just running it and running it and running it and never taking it to the garage and getting it maintained. At some point, it's going to break. Um, um, and even, you know, areas where um, work that's been done, looking at, at these bog bridges, for example, um, at the ends of the bog bridges, you end up with more pressure on the end of the bog bridge. So you need to do some maintenance to um, try and fix that. And perhaps you end up with a, a, a never ending story. Um, so the existing work, there is work that's been done that needs to be maintained and any new work that needs that is done will need a commitment to maintenance and i think those are things that are really really important to highlight and to to bear in mind it isn't a quick fix and run away there is a, a long-term commitment that's required um some of the um thoughts uh, around uh path re uh, repairs um focus around um, light touch work. Um, and this is uh, an, an idea of being able to do a little bit of work um, to fix things um, rather than to con construct a complete path. Now, I, please don't get me um, or take it that what I'm doing is here is suggesting this should happen on somebody's land. I mean, obviously, the uh, Lugalaw is um, private land, so it would need the um, uh, permission of the, of the landowner. Um, and it's, this isn't uh, a suggestion that there has to be work done. What I'm trying to do is to pick up what looks like uh, an opportunity, if you look at it objectively, that there might be, you could do some minor drainage work uh, to take the, uh, the drainage, the, the water off the surface and move it off the path to do some landscaping um, to keep people on a, a narrower line. And some of the uh, sections of path are quite steep. So you might be able to realign um, that and th there's some uh, al alternative routes that are already being used. You could potentially close down one area and realign people onto a more sustainable route. That would be a, an, an option. Um, but unfortunately, if you just looked at one part of it, you might realise that um, you're going to get onto a place where you've got more than a meter of peat. So we're back into this idea of light touch work. Um, sounds great, but there is no such thing on peat. There is no such thing as light touch. You can't do anything other than repair it, as in repair the peatland, or create a path. And there's nothing in between. So the idea of light touch work needs to be um, kind of taken with a um, in in the whole, if you like, in the round, rather than a a, a single section and thinking, yep, yeah, we can fix this. And this is what's really important with the work that I've been doing is this area wide look um, to look at the the entire path and to look at what can be done across different parts of the area. Um, so another path. Um, suggestion um, where we could could we do some light touch work on Camaderi? Um, we've got areas where it's eroded down to um, the the hard surface. Um, again, this looks great. It looks like we could be able to do some of that um, light touch definition of, of the line. You you head up onto um, areas where the ground is much steeper. So this is about forty percent gradient. Light touch starts to to become much more problematic uh, in those areas. You, you end up needing to construct a path. Um, and we've also got steep ground and deep peat. So the building of a path becomes building of a floated path on a very steep bit of ground. So all of these um, things are, uh, if you like, ganging up against us in terms of a, an easy solution or a, a simple way forward. Um, one possibility, um, let's, let's get some good news, is the Great Sugarloaf. 
Um, in terms of, again, um, it would depend on the, um, the landowner um, permissions to, to, to look at this. But in terms of objectively, we've got um, a hill here where there is a, a path. It's, it's a, a huge erosion scar, um, but there's no peat. Um, so there is a possibility um, to use the, the traditional upland path techniques to uh, repair this and reduce the visual scar and reduce the uh, impact on the landscape. Um, the good news is there's an application that has been made um, by the uh, Rural Recreation Officer, um, and that's been uh, successful. And there is funding available to do some repair works. And this was done on the back of the survey that we've done. It's not ready to start. We're not ready just to, to uh, get out there with a team, um, but um, we are in a position, there is some uh, money available, some design work will need to be done, um, and we'll need to think about how that can be delivered. Um, and one of the things that we've been um, discussing is the possibility of whether there's an opportunity for some kind of locally based team or a, some sort of training scheme to be developed. The, the big thing with path work is that you need skills. It's not something that you can just um, uh, turn your hand to of an afternoon. Um, people can do it, can do some basic um, path work um, with uh, a little bit of training, but to become uh, a, a proper path um, path worker, if you like, takes a lot of skill and a lot of training. Um, and the issue really is what happens if you put out a contract to repair this, um, you bring in a team from somewhere else um, and they fix it and then they go away. What happens when that starts to uh, require maintenance? You've not got anybody locally based. So what I'm, I'm advocating, I don't know whether it will be successful, but I'm advocating the idea of um, developing local, locally based teams uh, to undertake the work. Um, and there is a team, as mentioned, uh, uh, Helen mentioned earlier, the team on um, uh, Crow Patrick are working on a very similar uh, situation. The, the, the rock type is very similar. Um, the kind of uh, terrain is quite similar. So there is one uh, suggestion, which would be... Uh, bring the guys across and, uh, and start them off uh, and get some local folk involved. That's just a, a sort of uh, off the cuff um, suggestion. We've got issues in terms of the way that things can be um, procured. Procurement is a, is a, a, a barrier, if you like, for um, coming up with a way of doing this. Um, and we've, we've got to work our way around um, how this can be done effectively. But, just as an idea, um, having a locally based team, uh, base it around a, an existing model, maybe that would work. Um, the thing we've got to think about, I, I know I'm not giving you too many answers here, I'm, I'm really highlighting uh, what the issues are and, and what needs to be thought about before anything, before the first spade is stuck into the ground. Um, we need to think about where we're gonna work and what the priorities might be. So are we going to respond to visitor pressure? Are we going to be looking at places where the most people go already? Or are we going to be thinking about nature conservation um, and the, the areas that are of highest nature conservation value? Are we going to try and prioritise those? Are we going to be looking at areas where there is landowner support or if, if it's publicly owned land? Um, are those going to be the easy wins? Are we, we going to focus on that? Um, or are we going to chase the funding? Are we going to go, right, um, we can get funding for a particular path on a particular area. Let's do that. Even though it's maybe not the highest uh, or the most damaged path, it might be an easy one to get funding for. Um, and are we going to be looking at um, needing to do some trials um, for particularly in Wicklow? How do we manage uh, these areas of deep peat on gradients? Is it possible? And are there some trials that we could do? Could we prioritise on that basis? Um, the important thing in my head is coming up with what I would call a shared vision. Um, from my perspective, I think it's really important 
um, that we understand what it is that we're trying to achieve on a mountain uh, before getting the spades out or possibly even before applying for the funding. Um, and we've done this in a few areas. Um, we've done it at Errigal and we've done it at um, uh, Crow Patrick, looking at the idea of a shared vision, bringing people together um, and um, if you like thrashing out the ideas, what are the issues? What are the, what are the important things about a mountain? Um, and trying to work out how you might want to manage that mountain to take in everybody's considerations. Um, and that might be a way of helping to prioritize uh, some of the issues. And you might be able to do that across the whole area or um, sort of, if you like, regions within the area. Um, and that's, I think, one of the challenges. Um, and I think, if, if I'm honest, Mountaineer and Ireland have, have got a, a very um, important role to play uh, in terms of uh, the kind of recreational uh, advocates, but also that um, uh, conservation message um, that is really important in terms of uh, advocating for sensitive work to be done. And that brings me to the helping the helping the hills uh, initiative and this is something um helen's going to be a bit embarrassed now um but you as a as an organization uh, mountaineer in ireland you have got somebody who's an absolute gem um sitting in the right place advocating for you for access and conservation and the helping the hills work is an incredible um kind of piece of um, promotion, if you like, of what is the right thing to do. I'm not going to run through this, and hopefully you're all familiar with what Helping the Hills is all about. Um, but Mountaineering Island is, is sort of championing this, and I, it, it's based around similar principles as the Upland Path Advisory Group. Um, and it's about putting the, the mountains in the middle, putting thinking about the mountains first rather than putting our needs and desires uh, ahead of everything else and I'll, I'm going to leave you with that thought that what I'd like to see with uh, Wicklow is for those mountains to be in the middle of our considerations as we go forwards to try and find some solutions to do something to reduce our impact on them. If you've got questions, I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen and uh, you can put your videos back on um, and I'm happy to take questions on any subject related to what we've been what I've been talking about. And uh, my apologies if, if that was a bit rambly at times. I find uh, Zoom quite difficult uh, talking into the, the void and not being able to see what um, how many people have fallen asleep or are checking their emails. So uh, my apologies if that went a bit awry. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, well, I can see a few people turn their videos back on, so we haven't lost everyone anyway. Um, and yeah, look, uh, I don't think it was rambling. I think it was structured quite well and hopefully pitched um, well for the audience. I didn't warn everybody that uh, this wasn't going to be, it's not all happy stuff and it's not easy, um, but you've certainly given us a good sense of the, the scale of the challenges uh, that, that we face, but also, you know, things like the importance of uh, building expertise. And clearly there's more than enough work in Wicklow to support a team. Um, thanks for the, uh, the thumbs up for the Helping the Hills principles as well. I, I shared a link in the chat um, to the, the, the full set of principles. And ultimately that's about getting the, the right sort of path solution, one that will sit well uh, with mountain lovers, uh, a path that blends into the landscape, that functions well, um, and where possible, um, uh, created from local materials, that, that certainly helps uh, it to, to blend in. Anyway, um, time for questions. So you can use the uh, raise hand function or uh, put something into the chat. It's nice to hear voices, so uh, to be good if, if people have uh, have questions no questions 
I can think perhaps of a, perhaps a comment rather observation rather than a question. Thanks. I, I think that you. I think Chris, that's been a, a, a very, very good um presentation of I, I know Wicklow very well. I've been walking it since I was 15. So um, you know, and I, I very well remember walking doing the love walk when there was maybe one or two places where you'd you'd notice a bit of um you know walking basically from Bowen Abrina to the top of Lugla Quilla. Uh, and uh, it, there's only one or two places, but uh, or you can just the, the speed of erosion in the last few years has just been it's been very observable, you know. The numbers of people coming out, it's just uh, you know, you can you can see that and I think you're right about uh, social media and I, I, I've actually seen people up looking for the heart-shaped lake and uh, you know it, it, it's amazing um, what, what brings people out on hills you know but I, I, I think just surveying it quantifying what needed, what's needed to be there, quantifying the extent of them that's a very very important first step and uh, but uh, yeah the solutions are, are going to be difficult, you know, and, and I think you presented it really well. And uh, and it's just where the decision making falls on all of this is you know, obviously we've got different landowners, we've got public landowners, we've got uh, private land, we've got small landowners, we've got large landowners, and uh, you know, so there's a whole thing there. And I think raising the awareness and developing that idea of uh, a shared vision. And I think the Wicklow Open Council is, is uh, I have to congratulate them on, on working with Mountaineering Ireland and with National Park. That's the exact right way to go about it. But it's, it's where we go with this now is, is, the, is the big question. And like, uh, you could easily say, well, let's go to the most damaged places first. Or, uh, but I think we do need to have a good bit of debate before you actually, as you say, start work. So uh, I, I just welcome what you presented so far. And it's a, a terrific starting place uh, for us. And I, I've been to um, Crow Patrick and I've been up to Errigal and I've, I've seen the work going on there. And uh, yeah, and I've been to uh, obviously the Reeks where there's other work going on. And I've been up in the Moors and other places in, in the North where there's been good work going on. And uh, also uh, the, the bog restoration project, there's many of them going on now. And uh, in the Upland Irish Upland Forum, we're, we're keeping a very close eye on uh, bog restoration as uh, you know a, a really uh, an area that uh, needs to be a solution in in the climate change debate that's coming along. We need to get resources into that. But uh, thanks very much for the for the uh, because I think Wicklow, it's the most busy uh, place. It's probably the busiest mountain area in the country and it's also the most fragile and so uh, it, it's very important place for us to have done a survey like this thanks very much thanks Frank. yeah thanks thanks very much frank and I, I think the you know bringing peatland restoration into it um is good as well because uh we can't just look at um path erosion in or the impact of recreation in isolation from the other pressures on the, the upland environment. And if you haven't read yet uh, Hugh McLinden's article on peatland erosion in the latest issue of the, the Mountain Log, uh, I would recommend it. And in fact, Hugh sent me on uh, a link yesterday uh, to a video from the Peak District, which is worth uh, a look as well. And we'll be sharing that on Mountaineering Ireland's social media over the, the next day or two. It gives you a sense of um, how far you can get uh, with with peatland erosion or peatland restoration, rather? Um, any questions for for Chris? And don't don't be shy yeah. about asking the you know <laughs> yeah, <I laughs> the dumb laddie having, question. I yeah, oh. I, I have one, Helen. If I can ask Chris, and I was I was interested in um, in the early part of your talk, talk Chris. You were mentioning the, the potential opportunities of using eroded areas, areas, strips eroded down to the bedrock or sound ground in a way. Um, and I mean, uh, you're sort of nearly suggesting that it would be better to um, create an eroded trail by clearing maybe remnants of existing peat on that to get a stained trail, to get a linear route, which then protects the rest of the land 
around it. That's is that is that what you're suggesting as a as a way to do it? Yeah, um, and, and it's that's where looking at the whole path is is the important bit. Um, so the, there's two or three. Uh, I'm, I'm not actually going to name the paths because it'll it'll set hairs running. But there's two or three paths where um, it's it might be possible. Um, but um, so you've got uh, extended areas of, of erosion uh, down to the to the hard, but either side of that you've got uh, long um, sections where there is very deep peat so that wouldn't really work for those ones um, but I can think of two that have got um, the majority uh, we're either at bedrock or something hard um, and there's probably 100 or 200 meters where uh, there's still remaining uh, peat it's damaged peat so it need, you need to do something with it. And, and actually the solution there could well be um, to sort of clear a, a route um, and restore the edge. So what you would do is to uh, take that eroded edge uh, and reduce the, the gradient of the edge um, and revegetate it. Um, and, and that would then provide you with a line um, <laughs> without doing quite as much construction of a path. You're, you're really doing more like peatland restoration um, to generate that line. So there's there are a few areas, but that it's not everywhere. I, I don't I don't want to be sort of suggesting it anywhere you see uh, that it's come down to, to to the bedrock. Oh, that makes it fine because we can do it everywhere. Um, you've got to look at the whole path. But yeah, it, that's that's the idea. Hmm. I sound really negative, don't I, at the moment? <laughs> What's going well, on? Well, I... <laughs> No, I, I took that as one of the few positives in what you were talking about. <laughs> There's some some potential there for at least stabilizing the areas because the biggest danger to me is not the strip where not a narrow strip, but the the vast width that's being created in places now um, because people keep going outside words to get out of the road a bit, and you get the very very wide strips. So if we can if we can have a, a you know a robust strip and restore the people on either side of it, it seems to me to be a good way to think about it. Good, and Dawson, that's something we might, might come back to later is just some advice for um, those of us who are here with the, the path user head mm -hmm. on, um, mm -hmm. because it's quite clear there's no way, even if we had a solution, um, it's a lot, it's many, many years of work um, uh, to repair uh, even the parts that are feasible, uh, let alone um, working out a solution for the deep and steep uh, challenges. Uh, so it's quite clear that there are things that we need to take on board and maybe adapt our, our practices a little. So that's a, a heads up for a question that's coming, Chris. But um, we have two hands up. Alan Lauder, uh, you had your hand up first there. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thanks, Helen. I, I wasn't going to raise this one. Uh, but now you but, have. But, yeah. but, 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 Dawson, <laughs> but Dawson beat me to it, really. Be, uh, I, I was going to raise that as an issue, but from the, other, from the flip side, um, while that at first looks like an opportunity, actually, it's a problem. Because, what, but because if you... Uh, let's try and take this back a step, sorry. Um, you've got a deep eroded scar down to the bedrock. Uh, that's a problem, clearly, for the peatland. Uh, you can't restore peatland when it's got a scar that deep, because unless you restore the water table on a blanket bog situation to within 10 centimetres of the surface, you've still got a carbon emitting source. So there has to be a balance between accepting uh, some areas, if you're going to do that, you have to accept that you're not you're not actually creating a restored peatland. You're creating a suboptimal peatland. So you either accept that and move on <laughs> and have your hard path, or you don't do that and you try and restore the peatland in its in it to its proper state. Um, so it, 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 rather than it being an opportunity, it could be a problem, depending on who's making the decisions. So that's something we need to bear in mind and certainly could compromise the conservation objectives of the Wicklow Mountains SAC, because that's one of the key issues in terms of conservation condition. So that's one angle on it. So I hate I to- guess, I guess I'm just to jump in on that. I guess it depends whether you're going to keep people out of the area. Uh, exactly. You're, you're restoring an area and closing it off for people to come to. And I think, you know, and certainly there probably are areas like that. 
but yeah. I, 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 we're not going to be closing down the whole of Wicklow. So uh, no. No, yeah. that's right, Dawson. But but I've got yeah. a, and I've got a follow up point to right, that, right. Okay. Uh, which, which then which then <laughs> flows on which flows on from that. I suppose it's a and this is my question to Chris really, because uh, although I've got quite a lot of um, experience in path restoration from Scot from my Scottish days, um, w one thing I don't have any real experience of is is floating paths, and I suppose that's one of the things, Chris, that I would ask you. Uh, do you think that uh, you can float a path on a restoring blanket bog situation. You know, can you do the two things hand in hand? In effect, is what I'm asking. Okay, um, I think it's um, it, that's where we're into that experimental area. Um, the the issues um, are around essentially the water table uh, and trying to find a. a a situation where the, the path itself, if you float a path, is avoiding the very wet ground. Um, so um, as I think it's it's the difficulty is when you're on onto a gradient um, because you're going to have water flow, but you're also going to have movement of material. You can build something, but whether you can maintain it is another issue. And I think that we always get ourselves into this situation where um, people want to see um, things being repaired, but they don't necessarily think about that long term commitment, which is, you know, that there's there's no getting away from it. Once you once you built it, um, people will come and it, it does need to be looked after. Um, I think that your earlier point about um, it being a problem, I I completely see what you're you're getting at, and what I'm what I'm not saying is that that restores the peatland, but what I, what I am saying is that you can prevent further erosion of that area yeah. by using the peatland restoration techniques, um, yeah. and you then minimise the impact, and and I think that is the issue of are we talking about shutting uh, the mountains or are we trying to find a way of, of, of a compromise that gives something um uh, an opportunity yeah. of something and i agree with that uh, that chris and I, I actually agree with that approach and that it comes back to that shared vision approach which is about yeah. a, a group of people making a making a sensible decision about uh, about how to go about restoration of a mountain and some of that might be a compromise on on full peatland restoration and that's okay if everybody's agreeing on it uh it, it was just pointing out that you know we have to accept in some places yeah. it, that can't always be the answer because sometimes you want to go for the full peatland restoration job um and, and that would mean uh, avoiding that opportunity so anyway it's a it, it, the shared vision thing comes back uh, off of that, I like your point about advocating local path teams. I think we need the expertise in Ireland, which we don't have right now, and it needs to be built. That's really good. Um, integrated strategy, I kept writing in my notes here. Uh, you know, it, the nature conservation side has to come across. And my last question to you, sorry, and I'll hand over to everybody else. Now, it was always a danger to me taking over the questions, was um, about grazing. It's a, it's a, a huge area that I work on mm. a lot. And I'd, I'd quite like to hear your opinion uh, on what the relative, you know, ballpark relative contrib contribution that you think grazing makes to the to the uh, to compromising the, the the condition of the paths or, or the impact of erosion uh, that that's that's causing. I know what my feeling is. I just want, sure. like to hear yours from have, you've walked all the paths. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I th 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 what's really difficult is is that um, grazing is something. It's a Obviously, it's a contentious issue. Um, grazing is a big part of um, our culture, you know, uh, in, in across um, the, the Celtic world. Um, the, the grazing that's going on today uh, doesn't appear to be humongous. It's not, it's not incredibly high pressure. It's higher than I would like to see, personally. Um, but what, it, what I do think it is, is it's the accumulation um, the cumulative impact over decades and decades that is the problem. Um, so in order for it, for it actually, actually to repair itself, grazing has to, I, in my opinion, grazing has to be reduced really drastically um, because we are talking about a sick 
um, patient um, that needs surgery um, and that surgery needs recovery time. Um, and if we try and get up and run around with that patient, that patient's not going to do well. That, yeah. That's my feeling on it. Um, and that's, that comes from the perspective of a, a, a Hill user um, and somebody that's concerned about um, restoring the habitats. I want to be out there, but I can see that there's places I just really shouldn't be um, if I want to see them um, repair. And I, I recognise that's a, that's a hard line to take. Um, and it's a, it's a difficult one and not everyone's going to agree with me. Yeah, it agrees is a huge issue. And um, my personal opinion, and, and I've actually done some work on the Wickle Mountains on, on mm. grazing densities and the impacts on habitats. Uh, and we're dealing with some of the highest uh, deer densities in Europe uh, in the Wicklow Mountains. Uh, and that has a serious impact. And some of the habitats are for their for their habitat type or in some of the worst condition for those habitat types uh, that I've seen anywhere. So, uh, yeah, we've got a long way to go. <laughs> so I'll shut up now. Sorry. Uh, that doesn't surprise me at all. Thank you. Um, we'll pop you a quick question from the chat, Chris, if we may, and then I'll go yep, to sure. uh, Callum O'Callaghan. Um, did you look at coastal area, Pats? Um, like Brayhead um, or in the no. the air? no no we we stuck to the to the upland paths um, very specifically um, uh, and that's probably another piece of work yeah grant okay thanks Chris uh, Colm do you want to put a question yeah Helen thanks no just um, uh, just an excellent uh, presentation Chris thank you very much my interest in the whole area's uh, previous mountaineering career was that I was involved with uh, WOC and uh, Mountaineering Council Ireland, as it was at the time, and setting up of, of Mount Mehal. But as an agronomist, um, soil erosion, yeah, is of particular interest to me and would be, in fact, as as important as a climate change. But looking, in fact, actually at maybe one or two simple solutions uh, as an organisation that we might put through is... Um, Dawson mentioned there about paths and how paths widen. And sometimes what it is, is that people walk to the side of the path uh, because they don't want to get their um, clothing dirty. And one solution there would be a recommendation would be actually the gators. And um, it's just, you know, kind of um, that it would possibly help reduce that, you know, that uh, because I've seen it with people that uh, particularly in large groups, people will walk to the side um, and particularly in wet conditions or if the peat is, uh, if the peat is muddy because they don't actually want to get their, their footwear or their clothes dirty. So maybe kind of a subtle recommendation would be uh, uh, for people maybe to wear gaiters and try and, and reduce it there because Peat, in fact, actually, particularly in high rainfall uh, particles, uh, it's very, very soluble. So that's how we get a lot of uh, a lot of erosion. And maybe in a more contentious one is that um, areas that are highly eroded, that if clubs or large parties um, maybe could avoid those areas, particularly during um, months or areas of actually high rain, rainfall, or maybe look at some alternative thing, alternative thing there. So I don't know if it's workable or just maybe a suggestion or a solution there. So thank you. Colin, uh, thanks very, uh, very much. I, I think that leads nicely into uh, what I teed you up for earlier, Chris, is um, to, uh, based on uh, the survey work you've done, to share with us your suggestions for how how we can mitigate the impact that we have on the path network um, because regardless of how much uh, speed and success we move with it's going to be years before many of these lines are are touched yeah i think i think that's um a, a, a good question and uh Colin, that's your suggestions are a, a, a bang on uh bang on the money really in terms of what i would suggest um it's the it's the widening um, that is is a is the biggest um, problem. I think uh, it's expanding the the area of impact 
on the habitats. Um, so um, the recommendation would be stick within the, um, the area of damage as much as you can um, uh, and, and go through the wet bits. Um, and if it's too wet for you, think about whether that's the place for you to be. Um, and I think these are these are difficult um, things because it it's it's sort of from one perspective it sounds quite elitist um, to be saying oh unless you know what you're doing unless you can cope with it you shouldn't be there that's not really what I'm saying but I think it is really important for us to think about what is the impact that we're going to have on that day um, and you rightly say that um, the the peat is very soluble. Um, I, I remember I was there during some pretty hot weather and I tried going into a couple of the rivers and I couldn't see my feet uh, knee deep because it was it was black. Uh, the water is so um, highly um, contaminated is the word I need to use uh, with peat um, that some of those rivers are, are, are really, really dark. And that's just from the peat washing off. Um, and I think the, the issue comes down to us having expectations that we can go anywhere we want, when we want. Um, and we have um, a sort of, we've developed an expectation that it's Saturday, um, we have said we're going to go up this hill and therefore we're going up this hill. Um, and I, I think it would be very helpful for people to think about uh, adjusting their behavior according to what the weather conditions are uh, to have a plan b to have a think about you know if it's been raining for three days or five days is it really sensible to go uh, up uh, Malkley Vaughan um, where you're, you're on deep peak for kilometers that's probably not the best time or the best best place to go there would will be other places it's a difficult one because obviously people have plans they have limited time but having that plan b is a, is a big part of it sticking to the uh the line of um uh existing damage and thinking also about uh if you've got to climb up uh or down uh peat hags um to do that really really carefully rather than jumping down to lower yourself down that might in involve you sitting on a bit of wet peat but you know, that's that's life. Um, I think us being um, careful and respectful of the mountain um, is the least that we can do. So I, I would be uh, advising, think about where you're going, think about the conditions and um, find a way of avoiding um, the, the worst times. And you, I think you also already mentioned the idea of going in groups large groups on PT areas are um, really difficult to manage, um, particularly, you know, with the best will in the world, we, we all end up um, having a gossip um, and you, you become less um, aware of your environment and less aware of your aware of what you're, you're walking through. And I think that that's one of the, the difficulties with um, walking in large groups is uh, going through PT areas in large groups can create more trouble. And I think it's worth picking up that idea that um, if you, for example, if you've got 30 people going through an area in uh, five minutes, that's gonna have a higher impact than 30 people going through that area in three weeks. Because particularly if it's wet, um, the, the vegetation doesn't get a chance to rebound in between each um, set of boots. Um, and the more people that are doing it in a very short time, the worse it is. And that's where you, you stray into the, the, the problem with events. Uh, large scale events um, can have really uh, significant impacts in very short times. So, yeah, I think those are probably the things I'd, I'd, I'd like to offer a, a, a t as advice, if that's a, a worthy word of it. Thanks very much, Chris. And yeah, look, uh, I think everybody who's familiar with the Wicklow Mountains uh, can recognize that the rounded character um, does naturally lend itself to that lateral spread. 
And it's a message that we, we just have to keep repeating uh, to people about keeping to the center of the, the damaged line, uh, trying to prevent uh, the, the widening of, of the damage. Watch out for it the next time you're out there and you'll see on the, the margins of many of our popular lines, um, Heather, that's uh, been worn away that you can just see the, the branches rather than any vegetation. It's killed and once it dies, it's going to lose its ability to hold the peat together and we, we lose more peat and uh, the, the cycle continues. Uh, yeah, look, we've better bring this to a close and have to try and find something fairly positive to say, but uh, I think you've given us some really good advice, though, and uh, I've seen it work in practice that um, idea of getting what is often a disparate group uh, to work together uh, to develop a shared vision. And really, the only way that works is everybody who's around the table has an interest in the mountains. So putting the mountains at the center is um, I've seen it work and hopefully we will see it work in Wicklow uh, as well, but um, it's where we can find common interest and a platform from which to, to move forward. Undoubtedly, um, I mean, while we face some really daunting challenges, there is also much that we can do and we need to get on with it. And um, Brian Dunn and I had a, a brief chat earlier today um, about how we might move forward uh, to use the, the very valuable study that you've conducted for us um, as um, a means, I suppose, to secure the political will and the, the funding uh, that is undoubtedly necessary and to see if we can navigate the procurement process to uh, do it in a way that will help us build um, capacity here that we have that we can retain uh, rather than it going back on um, a ferry to Scotland. Sorry, with all due respect to uh, your adopted country, Chris. <laughs> um, uh, Brian or Louis, if you're still there, do either of you want to say anything on behalf of the Wicklow Uplands Council? Uh, because uh, um, I think it's fair that you, you deserve uh, credit for uh, bringing in this project to where we're at and your connections with the private landowning community in particular are really essential uh, as we seek to address erosion outside the, the park. Brian. Um, yeah, thanks Helen for putting me on the spot. <laughs> no, um, listen, it, it's fantastic. And I suppose thanks to Chris for a fantastic piece of work. Um, I suppose we discussed the shared vision and we, we talked about it earlier as well. And I suppose just the fact that the PAT survey itself had so many different stakeholders involved, you know, the, the lead partners, MPWS, we had Quilcia, Mountain Area Ireland, um, Mountain Mail, Dublin Mountains Partnership, we took County Council. So we've already have, you know, people interested, engaged in this. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can bring that forward. And as you were saying, Helen, I suppose the next challenge is to try and, get the political will behind it, you know, and start to, to work and identify those areas that um, work may be appropriate. Um, and we had discussed before about the, the Sugarloaf um, and there's a fantastic opportunity there with that new ORS funding that has come through. Um, so if we can do even anything like has been done over on Cropatrick, um, if we can bring something like that to Wicklow, I think, you know, we're really on a winner and build up the, that skill set. So. Look again, I suppose it's just it's it's thanks to Chris and the survey work that has been done to to get that baseline and to really present a very solid findings, you know, as to look at this is this is the condition now. Um, you know, it's and it's only with that kind of accurate evidence that we can go on to to lobby for the, the funding that we need. Um so yeah, look, I suppose that's all I have to say at the moment. Um it's it it is great. And Helen, thanks for hosting tonight as well. Um just and for mentioning Ireland support throughout the process too. Um, it's great. And, you know, it's important to be getting the message out far and wide as well as to what we can all do when we're on the mountains and, you know, just trying to, to stick to paths and to be to be more aware um, of it um, that we can all do that, I suppose. Excellent. Look, thank, thank you, Brian. Um, I, I'm going to put somebody else on the spot. Um, um, we haven't mentioned the Delta Lock and Wicklow Mountains National Park master plan tonight, uh, but uh, we're fortunate that Dawson Stillfox is not only a Mountaineering Ireland volunteer, but he's also uh, leading the process of working uh, with Falch Ireland, the National Park, the Council and others uh, to 
take a more holistic view uh, of how we manage uh, the, the Wicklow Mountains and particularly people's interaction with them. Dawson, any thoughts to, to send us to bed um, with a smile on our faces, uh, maybe? Well, uh, I'll do my best. I mean, the, 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 um, the, 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 the draft plan is um, signed off by all the various partners Helen, and um, it'll be the um, mature impact statement and the appropriate assessment have been done, and it'll be coming out for public consultation quite soon now, within the next month or so. Um, it's just a sort of final round about everybody so they can agree the language. Um, so very soon that plan will be going out for public consultation. Um, behind the public document, uh, and this is the bit where I'll do try and put a smile on the face and there is a, there is a, uh, a draft costing of it all, that, that will not be appearing out for public consultation. Um, but I can't say that within that, there is a recommendation for um, a permanent footpath team like Chris was um, mentioning there um, to be run. Uh, the lifetime of the plan is a seven year plan. So it's a seven year program is what we've, we've put it in for. Um, and we've used Chris's study as the base for trying to work out what resources would be needed for that team and put that in. Now, just because it's in that doesn't mean it's going to happen, <laughs> um, because obviously, uh, primarily, it's looking to a variety of government departments and sources to fund it. Um, but um, it, it, you know, once the plan's there, then that does give an opportunity for. Um, people to start lobbying and pushing and promoting it and uh, hopefully supporting the the various departments to come up with the funding um, for it. Um, so so it is it is good news, uh, but it's only good news if it actually happens. You know, and uh, that's the difficulty always with plans uh, is that they um, they need implemented, they need delivered, and they need to, to actually make things different. Um, but if you keep an eye out for uh, it, it'll be hopefully fairly, um, uh, it'll, it'll hopefully be fairly uh, sort of well, well advertised that it is coming out. Um, there will be, you know, there was, it'll be, there was a previous phase of consultation um, during the development of the plan. We got very good feedback on that, very comprehensive feedback. Um, so hopefully we'll get good feedback and support, hopefully, um, next time around as well. So probably. End of October, start of November. I think we're due to present it to Wicklow County Council at the start of November. Um, and thereafter, it would be a public consultation period would start at that point. Brilliant. Well, um, that, that is uh, even more positive than I had anticipated, Dawson. So uh, thank you. And um, I think those of us who are on the call tonight will we'll certainly let people know when that consultation opens. Um, there's going to be lots of expectations um, focused on the, the Dundalock and Wicklow Mountains uh, master plan. Um, I think much of it from people who genuinely don't appreciate how fragile uh, the natural resource that is at the centre of our mountains is and how we need to... Uh, uh, measure twice and cut once uh, because we're, you know, we have used up a lot of the beautiful wild character of our mountains, um, the stuff that uh, inspires many of us. And we, we really need uh, to bring as much collective wisdom as we can uh, to how, how we move forward. Uh, the fact that the, your study, Chris, has coincided uh, with uh, the, the master plan has been helpful. I mean, Dawson's referenced how uh, your work has already fed in. Uh, so it, it is it is good that the, the two were happening uh, at the same time. Um, unless anybody else has got a really burning question and wants to pop up a yellow hand, I think you've all been fantastic. Thanks for sticking with it. Uh, thanks for your interest in joining us tonight. And um, please, uh, go and uh, share uh, share what you've heard and learned uh, tonight uh, with others. And particularly if you're part of a walking group, however big or small, um, please share some of that uh, advice we got as to how we can mitigate uh, the impact of our activities on, on the mountains. And I think particularly that, that thing of flexibility, not being wedded to what's in the, the club 
program, be aware of how uh, the ground lies and um, let's try and be as sustainable as we can and be a voice for uh, the protection of our, our lovely mountains. Uh, thank you all very much and thanks in particular uh, to Chris and to the Wicklow